Thanks a lot for coming here tonight. Uh, my name is Kostas Karamarkos. I'm a journalist, amongst others, and uh, my role tonight is to say a few brief introductory remarks, not only in relation to the topic, but also in relation to Dr. Kostis Karpozilos, a historian who is going to talk to us about the Greek-American left. Uh, Kostis Karpozilos is a historian. historian. He is the director of the Contemporary Social History Archives. Feel free to Google the archives. There is a lot of impressive material on the web. Uh, he has a degree in modern Greek literature at the University of Thessaloniki, and that shows even when he writes a, uh, a book of history. Uh, he completed an MA in historical research at the University of Sheffield in 2003, a PhD in history at the University of Crete, and uh, his thesis focused on revolutionary diasporas in the USA and the trajectory of Greek-American radicalism in the 20th century. Uh, he's uh, written uh, scripts for uh, documentaries dealing with the Greek-American uh, left. And tonight's uh, topic is basically based on this book, Red America, uh, Greek Migrants and the Vision of a New World, 1900 to 1950. Uh, it was published in uh, 2017 uh, by Creed University Press, and uh, there are a few copies of the book. Uh, I've read it, I liked it a lot, and it was welcomed by all serious book reviewers in Greece, regardless of their ideological persuasion. Uh, why was it welcomed? It's uh, well-researched, well-written, and uh, very, very readable. Uh, currently, he's working on a book about uh, the Greek left. Now, uh, we must not forget to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, custodians, the Wurundjeri people of uh, the Kulin Nation, and uh, let us pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the cultures, and the hopes of Aboriginal Australia. And let us remember that uh, this land was, is, and will always be Aboriginal land. We have to state the obvious every now and then. Uh, briefly, uh, I want to say in my introduction a few, three or four basic ideas that run through the book of uh, Kostis Karpozilos, and to see whether or not there are similarities with the Greek-Australian left, regardless of the different historical uh, evolution of different societies uh, and different uh, political movements. Uh, similarity, one point, first point. He makes the point in his book, and I presume he will highlight it tonight, that the American left was, up to a large extent, a migrant left. Was that the case here in Australia? Uh, people who were involved in the past in the political struggles uh, of this land know that, yes, that was the case in Australia as well. Whether or not we're talking about the Communist Party of Australia, which was dissolved in the early 1990s, and the involvement of Greek migrants from the 1930s, or the establishment of uh, ethnic-speaking branches in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. Greek-speaking branches, Italian-speaking branches, uh, Yugoslav, I think. Uh, the Jewish community had uh, an important influence in the Communist Party of Australia. Now, the Greek migrant community in Australia was also involved heavily in the Australian Labour Party. And at least when it comes to the Victorian branch, let us remember that uh, the Victorian, for those who perhaps don't know the details, the Australian Labour Party was never a mass party. The, its entire membership throughout Australia varies anywhere between 40 to 60,000 people. And the numbers in Australia are approximately, in Victoria, are approximately 10,000. And uh, the vast majority of those members do not align along functional, functional lines. But again, when it comes to the socialist left, the backbone, the foot soldiers of the socialist left were Greek migrants. I remember, I clearly remember in the 80s and the 90s, numerous Greek-speaking branches throughout the suburbs north and uh, mostly suburbs of uh, Melbourne. And uh, there were Italian branches, later on Arabic-speaking branches. So the migrant influence in uh, the Labour Party, in the Communist Party, and other small parties of the left was significant in Australia as well. Uh, 
Now, difference, one difference, another point. If I remember correctly, uh, Karpozilos makes the point that the legacy of the Greek-American left is virtually non-existent. Not that the Greek-Australian left is dominant, but personally, I am of the opinion that the legacy of the Greek-Australian left is still present in the Greek community of Melbourne, to talk only about Melbourne, the city that I know. Uh, in the wider Australian community, we must never forget that what we enjoy today, multiculturalism, ethnic broadcasting, teaching of community languages in various public schools, it was the creation of the ethnic rights movement, and in that movement, the involvement of the Greek Australians and mostly first generation migrants was important, substantial. And even today, the multicultural bureaucracies of Australia or representatives of ethnic backgrounds in mainstream political parties are the legacy of the left of a bygone era. Even people who can be found in the bureaucracy, uh, Victorian multicultural community and uh, other organizations. Uh, is there an intercommunity influence, legacy? Yes, there is. I mean, let's start with something somewhat recognizable, uh, Neos Cosmos. We tend to forget that Neos Cosmos exists today, the most influential publication in Australia, not because it was a great idea, a grand idea of individuals, it was the product of the Greek-speaking members of the Communist Party of Australia. So, Neos Cosmos as a legacy was born out of the involvement of the Greek-Australian left. Let us move to the cultural uh, spectrum. Uh, Okay, in a few weeks we have the film festival, okay? It is mostly, for the vast majority of the people who go and watch Greek movies now, it's mostly, personal opinion, a social event. But it was born in the early 90s, in the early 1990s by people who identified as being left, politically or culturally. So it's not just a social event that was engulfed by the community or the creation of enlightened individuals, it was the product of discussions week in, week out. People who identified culturally or politically as being left wing. Even two years ago, when we had the postal vote for marriage equality, you might all remember that Greek organizations, including this community, or the church, or other community organizations, either they did not speak out in support of marriage equality, or they actively campaigned against marriage equality the Greek uh, church, and they're still campaigning against uh, the abortion legislation in uh, New South Wales. Uh, 53 people signed a letter uh, saying, no, we're Greek Australians and uh, we do support marriage equality. There were people who come from that tradition, that legacy. Uh, now, another point that Karpozilos makes is that being a left-winger in the States in the first half of the 20th century was a way of becoming a member of the United States of America, of a political community, not only with cal uh, cultural, linguistic, and other uh, parameters, but also was, okay, as a result of the Cold War, you were a communist, you could not access the USA. You can't even do it today. But in those days, through communism or through socialism, the migrants themselves and the American left was engaging uh, the Greek Americans, since this is the subject tonight, uh, into a process of integration, you want to call it assimilation. That's a, another discussion for another night. Uh, and there are similarities with our own situation here. In here, of course, the left redefined and still tries to redefine the concept of Australian. Uh, but there are a few similarities here. Uh, and also, uh, Karpozilos talks about uh, transnational identities. I mean, uh, the fact that you can belong, our identities, our identities are multiple, and uh, they have to do with values, they have to do with uh, culture, they have to do with language. The, American the Greek American left was not only engaging in the political process through the American unions or American political parties, uh, it was also engaging 
with the politics of Greece. And the same happened here. I mean, if we are to go back in the 60s, early 70s, uh, all the people who mobilized against the military junta in Greece uh, were people who were actively involved in the political process of Australia. Uh, we don't have a similar book here in Australia. We do have memoirs, personal accounts, but a greater narrative does not exist and it will be a good idea if somebody someday attempts to do something similar. Uh, to say a bigger story, to engage a conversation with uh, our own tradition. Uh, these are basically the remarks that I wanted to make and uh, I want to encourage you Tonight is the second lecture. The whole process was kicked off last night at the Ithacan Philanthropic Society by Professor Dimitris Christopoulos when he addressed the issue of trace and minority rights. He's back tomorrow to talk about uh, what uh, it means to be Greek in the 21st century. Since the creation of Greece back in the 1830s up until uh, the 21st century, uh, Karpozilos comes back for a lecture in Greek. Tomorrow's lecture at 7 o'clock here is in English. Kostis Karpozilos comes back on Wednesday to talk about a 19th century, late 19th century intellectual and activist, uh, Stavros Kalergis, who is a key figure when it comes to the introduction of socialism and socialist ideas in Greece. They join together forces uh, on Thursday uh, to talk uh, uh, about other issues. And uh, I think... It's, uh, we're lucky to have the opportunity to listen and share their own knowledge and uh, their own research. And it might be a good idea if you also, if you're interested, if you follow them on social media. Uh, parting remarks before I invite uh, uh, Kosti Karpozilo. Together with Professor uh, uh, Christopoulos, recently they've written this book. They had uh, 10 plus one questions dealing with various issues when it comes to, uh, in relation to Macedonia. The book is also available, but if you don't find it or uh, if they run out of uh, copies, it's available online. The whole book can be found online. Thanks for this opportunity and uh, without uh, saying anything else, let us all welcome one of the most impressive historians uh, today in Greece. The ones that uh, define uh, historiography in Greece now are in the late 70s, in their uh, early, uh, late uh, 60s, early 70s. He's in his early 40s. Uh, his uh, entrance into the Greek historiography was impressive, and we will hear from him again, I think. Costa. Thank you. Thank you for this generous introduction, more than generous, and I would like to thank all of you for being here. And since this is the first night that I appear in this series of seminars, I would like to thank the community and I would like to thank Nick Dallas for this invitation. And I have to say right from the start uh, that I'm impressed, positively impressed. Uh, when we entered with Dimitris uh, upstairs, or it's not upstairs, it's downstairs. No, it's upstairs. The, the room where the educational activities are going on and we met the members of the board and we went around. We were positively surprised because what you have been doing here challenges major stereotypes of how Greek communities abroad operate. I'm talking about the aesthetics. I'm talking about the, the approach to things and above all, this sensitivity when it comes to the relation with the homeland. I think that this is a prototype, this is a best practice, what uh, is happening in this community, and it would be fortunate for other communities to follow this example. So I, I will talk about this issue, the Greek-American radicalism, and I know that some of you know much more than I do when it comes to the transnational connection of this forgotten world. So I thought that it would be, it might help if I try to give you uh, a sketchy account of how I approach this issue. And then I would love to have your feedback and if there's a different approach or if I could, you know, if there's a different angle. So when I was in my early 20s, I was just, I had just finished my BA and I was interested in history. It was, I thought history was a way 
to continue my political activity, and it usually happens this way, or it happens for some people, I found a copy of this newspaper. You know, it's one of those things that show up in an archive, you have no idea about it, and suddenly it's just a piece of paper. And Bros, a newspaper I had never heard before, Forward for the Communist Society, you see there the illustration. And it was obvious that I was one of the few people in Greek, maybe in Greece, because I'm not a Greek American, who had encountered, encountered this newspaper. And this is a publication, the newspaper published by the Greek Language Federation of the Communist Party of the United States in the 1920s and the 1930s. And that was, I have to admit that I was astonished because I had no idea that this world existed. And while I was reading the, this newspaper, I realized that I had to address two stereotypes. I, uh, this newspaper, the existence of this newspaper, helped me to challenge two stereotypes. The first stereotype is the stereotype of the Greek-American community. I'm Greek, I was born in Greece, I was... I had no contact with the Greek-American world, and my perception, and it was a very limited perception, it was a, a very um, charged perception, was that the Greek-American community is a conservative community where the dominant narrative is that of success, anti-communism, and integration, successful integration in the American society. And suddenly, there's a communist newspaper. Wow. The second stereotype that's relevant to my political formation as a leftist in Greece was the idea that the United States as a whole is a society where social conflict belongs to a past and more or less that the American society is not a society that one would be, in, one would be interested in the politics of socialism and communism. I have participated in numerous demonstrations, and I'm sure some of you have done the same, where the main narrative of the anti-Americanism of the 1980s and 1990s would portray the United States as a country where nothing good is happening for humanity. And that was, you know, a social product of this atmosphere. So looking at this newspaper was an entry point into challenging my own understanding of politics and my own understanding of how this world uh, works. And I decided that I'm going to devote my time and energy, since my political plans for the revolution were not uh, very uh, successful, uh, in, the, in writing the history of this world. And I, when I went to the States for the first time, I tried to find um, some archives, some collections, and there I... It, was, it took me a month or so to understand that I had to overcome a major difficulty. That this history that I was supposedly interested in had left no visible traces in the institutional memory of the communities. So in a point, up to a point that confirmed my stereotype about Greek-American communities. But leave that aside. And I started looking for information, memoirs, documentation, anything, anything that could reconstruct the world around this newspaper. And I had to go to various places. I had to go to look for the archive in destinations that I had never thought before. Parts of the information came from Greece. When you go to the Greek foreign ministry, you will find uh, uh, files from the consulates and uh, embassies around the world where one major concern for the Greek state is the documentation of political activity of Greeks abroad. That's, whole, that's true for all communities. So if one goes to Greek foreign ministry and asks for the Melbourne files, I'm sure there will be tons of revelations regarding the policing of the community and the interest of the Greek state in dangerous ideas. So one part of the story is a Greek story. Then I want to Moscow, where the archives of the Communist International are stored, and there I found the internal, let's say, proceedings of this world of Greek-American radicalism. So the, the 1920s and the 1930s, the members of this movement thought that the best way to preserve their documents was sending them to Moscow, where the Third International had its headquarters, and that 
they w the documents would be safe there. After 1991, with the developments in Eastern Europe, these archives suddenly become available to researchers. So another dot is Moscow. Then in the States, there were labor archives, labor collections, mainstream press reporting on incidents where Greek Americans had some role. So for instance, this is a new, this is a photo at the aftermath of the 1914 strike in Colorado. Possibly you have seen a film on Louis Ticas, who is a recognizable figure of this world. This is the destruction of the labor camp there, where Louis Ticas, the Greek American boy from Crete, is shot, and that's an additional source for my research. So it after a couple of years, I think, because you know it takes time for ideas to develop, I realized that immigration as a, as a topic and radicalism as a sub, uh, you know, uh, an additional topic, is a meeting point of three or four dimensions of space. We usually think of the, of migration or as a process that involves point A, departing, point B, arrival departure and arrival. And if there's repatriation, we consider the connections between these two. At the end of the day, though, I think the, the picture is much more complicated. The history of migration, and this I, I think is, I am generalizing, but this is not true just for the transatlantic migration to the States, is a meeting point, in this case, of American history, because this is an American strike, a major a milestone in, Amer in the American labor movement, for instance. of Greek history, because these subjects, the ones who were active in these events, are still of interest to the Greek world, to the Greek state. And of course, there's an additional layer, the Greek-American layer, because these people are active within a community. They operate, as they say, as Greek workers in America. And if you think about it, these three words depict these three layers. Greek, coming from Greece, that means, and we can discuss about what that means, how one defines as a Greek, workers, the class, uh, you know, dimension in America. So all, you have the different worlds there. And if we think of migration as a, as a meeting point of three different uh, layers, then one could argue that the, that the worlds of ethnic radicalism this type of newspapers, these types of groups, these incidents in history can allow us to understand that there's a trajectory there. And the trajectory is quite simple. I mean, if, if I want to summarize in five minutes, one can say that workers arriving in the United States who are indifferent to the ideas of social struggle because this, they come from a backward backward in the terminology of the 20th century when it comes to the development of capitalism. They come from a backward area of Europe, that is Greece in the 19th century and early 20th century. They arrive in the States. They are in the vast majority workers. There's no question about that. Migration is a phenomenon that goes hand in hand with labor. They work hard. And some of them, not all of them, are involved in violent incidents and strikes that arise out of necessity and not out of ideological understanding of history. Later on, small groups of workers that are active in these labor strikes in the 1920s become the protagonists in the formation of a typical way of addressing ethnic politics in the United States, that is the ethnic radical group that one can find in buildings like this. This is Spartacus in New York. I can imagine that already you have formed the association with Democritus, for instance, in Melbourne. The choice of words, it's always Spartacus, it's Plato, there's always Democritus, figures that make this connection to the old land obvious with an ideological, an additional ideological layer. I am Spartacus, you, you have seen the film, all of us have. Where these people meet, they publish a newspaper, they publish books. These are publications of the Greek American left in the 1920s. 
you see what their concerns. They want the, the Greek American radicals think that the major issue that does not allow their fellow workers to emancipate is the influence of Christianity. So they translate this very, this was the best selling group, uh, book of the 1920s, Communism and Christianity, that highlights the, uh, the similarities of these two ideologies, that here we have a, a call for emancipation that in the ancient times was Christianity and now in the 20th century it's communism. And they form a bookstore where they have this amazing slogan, read today in order to rule tomorrow. So where knowledge becomes a way of emancipating oneself and knowledge is the key that will allow the true conscience of the working class to emerge. And that's the word taxisiniditos, which is the Greek American translation, this parenthesis, of working class consciousness. So it's a, they adapt the, the lexicon of the American left in their own grammatical and... Uh, and uh, language. And as usually these groups, and I'm sure this is recognizable for many of you, do they form a social and cultural world where they gather in the Spartacus building, they read the newspaper, they go around, distribute it, they sing, as this is the, from the 1930s, this is the theater and uh, musical group of the, of the Spartacus society, where they will perform um, you know, revolutionary songs and traditional songs, and in a way they will reinforce this identity of being an immigrant who at the same time is a radical. All right, it's more than five minutes, but I'm, I'm reaching so, uh, somewhere, so be, please be patient. And what do the radicals do in these cir circumstances when there is a social crisis? This is a depression. They think that the time is ripe that now these men that are sit here depressed and uh, destroyed by the impact of the capitalist crisis, they are ready to strike, they are ready to understand the true meaning of the social reality and they will join forces in what? In a union that's going to strike and this is a photo from the 1937 great strike at the General Motors factory where you see the workers have occupied the building and they, were, they are demonstrating workers' power in this very symbolic way. We who produce the cars, we will enjoy the cars, these are the seats there, for our own pleasure. This is as revolutionary as it can get. I mean, the idea that the means of production are ours. And they will fight. And they, there are the stories of heroism, there are stories of sacrifice, there are stories of internationalism, things that, you know, the, in a way one ex expects when looking at these groups, for instance, these are the Greek-American volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, where they are reading, they are holding there in their hands the newspaper and bros that we saw, that my discovery, the first photo. Huh? So again, here, just a parenthesis, add this dimension, an additional dimension of geography, where people are not just in the state or are Greeks in the state that are active in radical politics, but they, are, they fight in Spain for a struggle that is, they consider to be global. They express themselves in Greek, but they are part of the international brigades and they arrive in Spain with other immigrant groups, Italian Americans, Jewish Americans, Polish, Amer Polish Americans, young boys, because they think that there's a wider, the broader issue, uh, the danger of fascism, blah, 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 at the point where Greece is under fascist oppression, Metaxas regime. So they think that they fulfill their internationalist role at the same time their national role as Greeks in fighting fascism in Spain. And at the end of the day, when we reach the 1940s, because if this is a very sketchy account, this, the same people or their a second generation steps in and begins, is interested in what's happening in Greece, the 1940s, you know, uh, there is a huge interest in Greek political affairs uh, across the world, uh, given the story of uh, Greek resistance to fascism, where these people will form 
cultural groups or they will make the you know star sign for Greece where they invite progressive actors and singers to sing for Greece, sing for the liberty of, the, of Greece, and at the same time demonstrate the role of diaspora in supporting the national cause back home, as in this case. So this is the read El No Americano Vima, which is the newspaper after Ambrose. And here you see it's usually men, uh, 1940s, uh, sitting around in a cafe neo at the end of the day. But this is our cafe neo, the cafe neo of the cohesive, social, cultural, and political world of the Greek American left. So this, when I had all, all those photos, I, I mean, I could, I could give a narrative based on these moments. And it, it works. I have to admit that it works. I mean, there's a linear account where you can see different episodes, and one would say that this is the contribution of the Greeks in the Greek-American left. But I wasn't satisfied with that, because I thought that possibly doing this was limiting this story to a very narrow understanding of the world of ethnic radicalism, where the important thing is the world of ethnic radicalism becomes a bit um, insular. That, you know, the splits and the discussions and who left and who joined forces with whom and if there was a guy in Pittsburgh doing something and all the details that you get that at some point might be of interest, especially to those coming from the left or having any association with leftist politics. But I was wondering, is this the... Is there another story in this story? And the moment I realized that, I consider it a funny story. I hope you find it, uh, you think the same. In 1922, the Communist Party was split uh, in the States, or there were five small groups called themselves Communist Party of the United States. Communist Party of America, Communist Party of the United States of America. And they had the, their own theoretical journal. And three of them, those parties, published a, a journal called The Communist. And a poor Greek worker in a city wrote a letter, uh, a very passionate letter about an issue that was published in The Communist, and he sent the letter, and the, the journal accepted and, uh, his uh, letter, and they published the letter. Just with, but before publishing it, there was a, a small print saying, Comrade so-and-so sent us this letter on current affairs in Greece. We were publishing it, but we have to admit that originally he wanted to send it to the other communist, you know, from a different group. And they said, okay, if, I'm going, if my effort is to chart this history, I might reach a point where my, my study will limit this to the inner world of the Greek American left, and then there's always the danger if you have seen the life of Brian, that famous scene, People's Front, Judea, Judea's People Front, where one is lost in the details of the inner world and possibly is missing the broader picture. So I thought that is there any other way? Is there a way to discuss Greek American radicalism as an entry point to the broader issues of the Greek immigrant experience in the United States, and if not only the Greek immigrant experience in the United States, but in general, the immigrant experience in the United States. Because to begin with, isolating a group, any ethnic group, from other ethnic groups is based on a very, you know, it's like a selective process where you're taking them under your microscope, and this is what historians do, but there's the, always the, the, the danger there that you might isolate them from, the, from their surroundings. These people did not live in an enclave. They worked in the factory with an Italian-American worker and an Anglo-Saxon worker and an African-American worker. So how can we study the world of the Greek-American left if we would pay only attention to Mr. Costas who wrote a letter to the communists in 1922 and tried to find out if he was addressing the one faction of the communist party or the other. And I thought, I'll give it a try. And so what I will try to do in the, uh, in the remaining minutes is to suggest ways where this story of ethnic radicalism can help us address broader questions. And the first issue that is the, the dominant issue, I think, in the immigrant experience 
is this debate, Costas uh, already implied this, integration, assimilation, we're Greek workers in America, are we Greeks or are we Americans? And I could see that throughout the 1920s and 30s and 40s, there is a constant debate within the immigrant communities and within the immigrant left, the ethnic left, on this question. Because this is a very theoretical debate, on the one hand, that has to do with the Marxist understanding of the worker and his true identity, or his false identity. And on the other hand, it's a very practical question that has to do with everyday organizing. And I could see that there were two lines of thought, and this does not mean that we have two, you know, two groups that are, uh, are debating, but we have a conflation of the two uh, understandings of ethnic belonging, where on the one hand there is the idea that we are Greek workers in America, and we speak Greek, and we gather around in our Greek world, and we discuss in Greek, and we publish in Greek, because this is the only successful way to address Mr. Costas, who is working next to us, and who is primarily interested in what's happening in Greece, possibly, and speaks only Greek. And on the other hand, there is a push, there is a drive, there is a tendency to Americanize. And the American left, for decades, was involved in this theoretical and practical discussion about Americanization. In 1923, the theoretical journal of the Communist Party of the United States had this, you know, um, front uh, piece saying, be American. Get rid of your national baggages because this is just highlighting your connection to a backward world that does not allow you to develop into true revolutionaries in the United States. The rationale here goes back to the writings of Lenin, who, when he wrote a piece on migration, he said, migration is a progressive force because it takes the backward agrarian subject from Europe to the steel mills of the United States where we have the emergence of the new share of the working class. And if you think about the idea that this is happening in the mills, relates the Marxist understanding of this transformation to the dominant theory of the melting pot. So if the official policy of the government. That's the official policy of the government. In the 1920s, the official policy was that you are here and you should Americanize, and the melting pot, there's a great photo, I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't, uh, I forgot to, to bring it with me, where the, in the Ford factory there's a pot, an actual pot, huge pot, where immigrants, immigrant workers of the factory would enter dressed in their national costumes with their fustanellas or their Italian costume, and they would re-emerge American holding a small American flag. <laughs> The, the issue here is that this official national ideological project was reproduced within the left with the marker that we should aim for communist Americanization. What does that mean? Forget the national signifiers. You should not meet in the, your local branches. The goal is to create a communist party that will address itself in English and will demonstrate the unity of the working class because at the end of the day, this type of political formation is the reproduces the fragmentation of the working class. Are you following me or is it am, am I too abstract? So, fine? No, you're quite OK. So there's this discussion in the early 1920s. And this is not just, the, you know, it has nothing, it's not just the left. AHEPA, the, the, the well-known organization, was formed in Atlanta, the Greek uh, organization, as the American Hellenic Progressive Educational uh, Association, arguing that, the, uh, that if you want to be a member, you should meet and discuss in English. That the way to advance 
the way to escape poverty and repression, the old world, is to adapt to the novel conditions and since you are here, be an American. And this creates some tension because the guys that gather here in the 1920s and 30s, this is from the 40s, on the one hand understand or, or are ready to engage in this discussion and on the other hand, their social and cultural world speaks Greek. And they know for sure that when they go to the Cafe Neo with Ambrose and their newspaper and the leaflet, the ones there, the workers, the Greek workers, are primarily reading things in Greek and are interested in Greek affairs. So on the one hand, we have, uh, there's this debate. How does this evolve over the decades? In the 1930s, there's a turning point in American history, but not just in American history, where being, having an ethnic background is not seen as a negative aspect of your identity, in the, especially in the 1930s and in the 1940s. Coming from Europe, and if you were fortunate enough that your country had sided with the United States in World War II, you could be a proud American and at the same time a proud Greek without that being in contradiction. So this is why our fellow workers here in the 1940s can gather in a Greek cafe new and say, well, read Elino American Quo Vima, because it seems that being a Greek and being an American is in harmony. In the Greek left, or in the ethnic left, this is highlighted by the, by the new theory of ethnic belonging of the Communist International that after 1935 is starting to address the question of ethnic, the ethnic background in a positive manner. This is the, these are the origins of an understanding of history where the being a member of an ethnic community is not hindering your assimilation to the new working class, but it can be a positive factor because you bring with you the progressive slash anti-fascist credentials of your national ethnic belonging. How does that translate? That if you are a Greek, speaking about 8021 and the formation of the Greek state is a way to discuss national liberation against foreign oppression, oppression, and therefore, the left in the United States rediscovers its hidden or suppressed ethnic identity. And the, Greek, and the American left as a whole starts to recognize and to accept and promote expressions of ethnic difference in the form of language federations within the American Communist Party or the American Socialist Party or any other party of the left, you name it. The idea is that there's a party, and I heard that in Australia it's the same with branches. In the States it was called a federation or a language group where you can belong and you can publish your newspaper and you can sing your songs and you can gather around the table and discuss <laughs> politics back home. And this is seen to be in in harmony with your understanding as an American worker. What has changed from the early 20th century to the 1930s where we see this development is the transformation of ethnic identity in the United States and the de facto creation of a common space of experiences between workers that have been working for years together and their children go to the same schools and their children are much more Americanized where, and they, their children keep refer, referring to their ethnic identity, but at the same time, they're integrated in the American milieu. So if, for instance, if you're an immigrant in 1912 from Farsala to the United States, chances are that you speak Greek and you have no connections to the other uh, immigrant groups. In 1937, after 20 years of continuous stay in the United States, you and your children are much more aware of the broader social conditions and the everyday experiences in the working class neighborhoods create this atmosphere of working class unity that we see 
that demonstrated itself in the great strikes of the 1937 where workers can occupy their factory. So by that point, it doesn't really matter if one guy is a Greek American and the other is an Italian American. They belong to the same labor union. They speak English. I mean, they commun the labor union is, ba is not based on ethnic lines. They have their own social and cultural groups, but they have accepted the reality that they work in the same workplace and that they belong to the same union. So possibly the world of ethnic radicalism can help us understand this great transformation of how things change over time and how sometimes the dynamics of time transform the consciousness of the immigrant groups and even the uh, radical groups. The second suggestion is that is whether the world of ethnic radicalism can help us understand the invisible tensions within the community. The dominant narrative uh, is that the communities are homogeneous, we're all Greeks, and we belong to the Greek community. Okay, we go to the court and we fight among ourselves for, for you know, about the church and the, uh, the usual stuff. But more or less, the community wants to present itself as a singular body where there are no real differences and that we belong to the same nation and thus reproduced in the new world. I would argue that the study of the working class and uh, the world of ethnic radicalism highlights a tension that most communities tend to avoid. The tension between ethnic business and ethnic workers. What's happening in the sweatshops, what's happening in the, in the uh, shoe parlors, what's happening in the, in the ethnic restaurant where the conditions there are based on the idea that we come from the same village or we come from the same extended family or we come from the same place, we are patriotes, and that there is no class division. When I did this study and I focused on the 1930s, I could see how this picture of a harmonious community is challenged by the actual experiences of those who suffered or witnessed the real conditions in the ethnic um, business world uh, within the community. And usually this is a story not, uh, that uh, we, don't, we never discuss about this. And it's sometimes even in the left, it's, you know, it's always the big capitalist with someone, you know, have a big name that we tend to, to, to demonize for everything, because it's very difficult to address the realities in a restaurant where actually the demon is the shop owner. And one of the main issues, one of the main difficulties, or the main challenges uh, when it comes to the Greek American left, was this effort to challenge the idea that since we're all Greeks, we have the same interests. And what the Greek left tried to do, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully, was to highlight this class distinction that existed within the community structure when it comes to the elections in the community, but also in the everyday realities of labor and how this ethnic labor becomes a way of, um, of uh, continuing a pattern of oppression. In the 1920s, there's no mu not much discussion about that in the United States because the 1920s are the good times for American capitalism after, right after the war. It's in the 1930s and the period of the Depression where one sees, in the, um, if one reads the newspapers, complaints by, you know, boys that, are, that work in those, in the restaurant saying, you know, my, my patriot is not a patriot, he is a keratas because he, he, he lowered the wages, or he is not paying me, or he does not allow us to, to have a break. And these people, these invisible workers, because they do not work in the big factors where we will have this impressive photo of you know, occupying the building and stuff. They are the ones forming the backbone of the most militant labor unions in the, in the, in the, of the 1930s, and that is the labor unions of the hotel and restaurant workers, where the idea is that you form a union of all workers in this industry, it's called an industry, and there you have local representatives in each restaurant in order to challenge the hegemony of the small own owner, who is complaining at the same time, and he is saying, well, the communists are destroying me because they want 
you know, to secure higher wages, and if there are higher wages, I will be out of the market. Because this is how class antagonism works. It's not, you know, some abstract theory of class antagonism. It's the reality is that the Greek restaurant owner who had to sign an agreement with the union would complain and say, you, you are working in favor of the big companies because if I raise your wage, tomorrow I'll have to go bankrupt and you will be out of work. But you don't understand that because you're stupid and the communists are, you know, doing whatever they want with it because you, you are naive and they are controlling your mind. So the second issue that I think is of importance is whether the world of ethnic radicalism can help us understand these invisible tensions within the community. And the third issue, and um, this will be my final point, is whether the world of ethnic radicalism has something to tell us about the way political imagination works. Because these people did not join that movement because they, they followed the predefined pattern of social development. There's a very naive idea of the left that, you know, if you're oppressed, you will be radicalized. It, doesn't ha it has never happened like that. And I don't really understand why we keep reproducing this type of, you know, uh, rhetoric. These people were involved in radical politics because they believed in something. And I argue that they believed or they demonstrated or they, that they believed that the land of opportunity, the new world, could become the social new world. That the land, that the United States and this positive understanding of America as the land of opportunity and fulfillment, they gave, they, they provided their own understanding of this narrative by saying social equality and political equality. And that, which brings me to the last point, Costas always also referred to this, of being involved in radical politics as a way of entering American society. Here I want to make a critical point. Sometimes the, the language itself does not help us. I just said entering American society. This is like, or we tend to use the uh, phrasing, they found their place in the, in the American society. Yeah? This is like depicting a society that's there. It's like a canvas, like a painting. And the guy comes in and finds his place in the great American social map. I would like to argue that it's not like this. We should pay attention to the movement of these people and what they are doing in their everyday realities and decisions and failures and expectations, blah, blah, blah. Because actually their movement is the critical dynamic that reshapes constantly this, this picture. It's not a canvas where one finds his or her position. It's a canvas that's Constantly, constantly redrawn by the active movement of people that have traveled hundreds of uh, kilometers or uh, miles to enter the society. So let's not understand American society or any other society as a static uh, world where one just finds a place on a couch. But let's think of a society as a very dynamic space of opportunities and probabilities and uh, unpredictable um, results where our movement, our everyday movement, is redrawing the map. And if I want to highlight this interplay between ideology, aspiration, and the connection between the old and the new world, I would have to refer to this photo that encompasses a great paradox of the American working class movement, but at the same time, it provide, it, I think it provides us an answer to what happened in the United States in the, early, uh, in the early 20th century. This is one of the photos of the great labor strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, that was called, you know, the, the Manchester of the United States, where uh, young men uh, and uh, women uh, worked for 20 hours for minimal wages, and, you know, you had child labor, and suddenly there's a strike. And if you see, pay attention carefully, these are all Italian and Greek immigrants. If you pay attention to the photo, there's one detail that might disturb or might challenge the stereotypical understanding of American society. And this is the fact that these workers are holding the American flag. This does not fit with my understanding. They, they didn't, initially, this was a 
paradox for me coming from the Greece where my only um, connection to the American flag was burning the American flag uh, on the 70th of November. What's happening here? My understanding is that we have to see, to reconnect with a tradition of political imagination that thought that the United States of America would be the land of socialist transformation. Today, this looks like an absurd idea. In the 19th century, though, if one reads Marx, his prediction was that socialism will come to that country that has reached the highest level of capitalist development. If you want to find that country, that country is the United States of America. In the early 20th century, uh, an Austrian uh, Marxist, Werner Zombart, writes a book, Why is there no socialism in the United States? Arguing that it is impossible not to have socialism in the United States given the level of development of the American capitalism. The great strike for the eight-hour day is in Chicago in the 19th century. And if one starts to connect these dots, one can see an invisible tradition of radical politics that looks at the United States as an open space for political activity, because in the United States, we don't have the traditional forces that exist in Europe, and the space where there is a promise that if you come here, this is the land where everyone can become the king of the world. You remember Leonardo DiCaprio saying that, and, you know, the Titanic, I'm the king of the world. But for these people, the workers, the ideal of being the king of the world translates as the world that we can be the kings, we can be the ones who possess the means of production, we can be the ones who control society, we can be the ones who are on top. And there the American flag becomes a symbol of emancipation, a symbol of the unlimited possibilities of the future, a symbol of the way of fulfilling the dream of equality and liberty. If one remembers, there's this, uh, the Statue of Liberty, there's a sonnet there, uh, uh, that every uh, school boy and girl, school girl in the States knows the, uh, um, the, the, the actual wording, where if you pay attention, at some point it says, uh, come here, those of you oppressed, blah, 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 the wretched of the earth. The first verse of the Internationale, when it was translated in American English, and I'm not sure about the version in Australia, is arise ye wretched of the earth. I'm not sure, I mean, in England you have uh, a different uh, version, but in the States, uh, the first American translation is using that exact word just five years after the placement of the sonnet on the basis on the Statue of Liberty. And in my understanding, what connects radicalism, and this is not, has nothing to do with Greek-American radicalism in the narrow sense, with the United States, is this common belief that the United States can be the land where those, the invisible ones of the old world, those that are excluded from any form of political participation, in this land they can become the kings of the world. Therefore, the history of ethnic radicalism reconnects our understanding of the world to a hidden or defeated vision of political imagination where the United States on the one hand can become the country, you know, the social uh, space of social transformation, but also to a world where the protagonists are those, are, are the people that up to that point are excluded from our societies. This brings me to the last question that has to do with the political imagination of the left today in the 21st century, and to what ex extent we think of immigrants or refugees as protagonists in the story of social transformation. If we do think that they are the ones, or they could be the ones, the revolutionary subject of the 21st century, then we should at least start listening to their own voices, to their own ways of expression, to their own languages, languages that might be extremely different than ours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kosti. Um, that was exceptional. And because I know many in the audience 
believe yeah. that you've, um, you've got the wrong interpretation of history. I'm going to open this to a question and answer session, so yeah, if, that, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any questions, please? Or comments or disagreements or, the, you know. I thought I'd start. Look, I'm not uh, asking this question as a you know, feminist cultural historian or anything like that. I'm actually really interested to know. Prior to the Second World War here, women didn't engage particularly much in the workforce because it was the nature of society, first of all. Um, but there weren't that many jobs anyway. And here as well, men engaged in mm -hmm. the soup kitchens and so on. I, I'm very, after the Second World War, of course, women here worked side by side with their male compatriots. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, was that the case in America as well? I can't see any women there, so I'm actually interested mm -hmm. to know if that was the case in America, parallel situation. Well, up to a point, because uh, in the mills here, for instance, the vast majority were w young women trans transplanting their expertise to the novel industrial conditions. And so th you have young women from Europe transplanting their expertise to the novel industrial conditions. What was usually the case, though, that in the immigrant communities especially, this was just seen as a temporary stage before you get married. So you work there initially, but the minute you enter a family, then your role will change. At the same time, though, women are the leading force in certain unions where uh, that... Uh, for instance, in the fair workers' union, because again, their expertise could not be substituted by men. So in the fair workers' union, if I had a photo of that, you would see women being on the front line because the type of that work was considered to be only for women. The great transformation, though, is the 1940s, and especially during the World War II when men go to the front, and we have this huge change in American society where young women uh, enter the industrial force. As far as the Greek left or the left in general is concerned, there is a, uh, there's a contradiction there. On the one hand, there is not rhetoric about gender equality and gender, you know, female participation in politics. On the other hand, uh, there's the limitation of understanding this dimension only uh, being tied to the ultimate goal of social emancipation. So women cannot be real free unless we achieve the social society. And this produces a number of contradictions. Ambrose, for instance, the last page is written by women. But at the same time, what they write is recipes and stories from the old country. They are seen as helping the men in their political struggle. So the, on the one hand, the left operates as a space for political participation, and at the same time, it reproduces the dominant understanding of uh, gender dynamics uh, of the 1920s and 30s. In uh, this photo and the other one in Cathinio, uh, the people we see there, there are men of the first generation. What does the second generation mm -hmm. is involved at all? Well, the, the second generation was involved. The second generation was much more involved in the labor strikes of the 1930s. Sometimes we think about immigration and we forget that time is important in the lives of people. So we say the Greek immigrant of the early 20th century and then the 1930s. Well, the guy who was 20 years old when he arrived in the States in the early 20th century by the 1930s was 50 or 60 years old. So there must be a new protagonist. Huh? There must be a new, a younger generation that steps in. And this is the case in the labor strikes of the 1930s. These are not first generation immigrants, by the, by the way. This is the 1940s. They are in their 40s and 50s. But some of them are younger. And one can see a pattern there where ethnicity for this second generation 
is part of their political activism. They have never been to Greece, but Greece is important to them. When the third generation, though, enters the, the sphere, then things tend to change. The decline of this world. When, when did this world disappear? It disappears in the 1950s. Most historians will argue that this has to do with the politics of repression and McCarthy and you know, the anti-communist uh, drives in, drive in the United States. That's true. At the same time, though, there's an additional factor. That is the generational factor and the social dynamics of the World War II and how younger, the third generation Greek Americans, feel that this world does not mean anything to them on the one hand, culturally, and on the other hand, socially, because they are witnessing, they are experiencing, they are members and protagonists of the American ca post-war capitalist success. That's the end of the old working class cities. This is the moment where Greek Americans, and not only Greek Americans, leave the city and go to the suburbs, where Belonging to a union is not a prerequisite of radical politics or is not associated with radical politics. And where Greek Americans feel, younger Greek Americans feel, first of all, that they belong, the dual identity is hyphenated by anti communism. Greece and the United States form this. Remember the importance of Greece in the construction of, of the Cold War. The Truman Doctrine is formulated on developments of Greece. So what does it mean to be a Greek American and being a leftist in 1952? It wasn't the most wise decision when it comes to your, you know, to your uh, material conditions. And on the other hand, younger Greek Americans feel that they escaped the poverty of the 1930s and they are the successful ones. Why join the world of ethnic radicalism if you believe, if you have a home, you're satisfied with your living conditions, and you can compare your life of the 1950s to the life of your relatives in Greece, and where people think, oh, we are the lucky ones. We are members. You or you, are become, you become detached from a radical world that is declining and is getting older and older all the time. By the 1950s, this world does not exist anymore. It disappears because it's repressed, and McCarthyism played a role. At the same time, though, the left had, in the 1920s, there was a red scare in the United States. This did not destroy the, the ethnic left. People were deported in 1921, 1922, because the social conditions up to a point in the, the, held in the resilience of the world of ethnic radicalism. In the 1950s, the world of ethnic radicalism collapses, and I think that there's a generational factor as well. It's not the only factor. I, I agree that repression is important, but we should also see what's the, what's the reality for a third generation Greek American. You have to conform in order to succeed. Yes. Uh, career wise, as well as educational opportunities. True, but it's not just, if it was just repression, I think we would get one part of the story, conformity is not always, you know, imposed. Sometimes you conform because it suits you. It suits you too. Yeah. So the, how much Greek uh, principles uh, Spiro Agni uh, considered it uh, part of the Greek community? Spiro Agni was supported by the Greek community right. and during the junta. He's Nixon's vi pre vice president. Huh? But this is the last episode in a long, in a lengthy series where the Greek American identity after the Second World War is constructed on the idea of that if you want to be a good Greek and a good American, you have to be a good anti-communist. Because the importance of Greece in the strategic thinking and the investment of the American effort in Greece is linked to the idea of anti-communism. So some people are deported uh, and they go to Poland because they are not citizens and they are, they are persecuted as dangerous foreigners and others conform. Let's not underestimate this transnational anti-communist network, and I'm sure that you have similar experiences yeah. where, you know, you have, yeah. I was just going to say, we have, <clears throat> there are many similarities in Australia, but they actually happen later mm -hmm. in the piece. Um, 
I, I don't want to talk about uh, in work relations and trade, um, industrial relations prior to that because there were big problems before the Second World War in the labour movement. However, um, I want to focus on your, how interested you are in developing this thing of the, what, what was the political imagination. And you talked about the importance of um, transformation. And you said, well, they saw themselves in a particular way. And so they, they stood their ground for their legitimacy in terms of what they could um, demand. Mm -hmm. But there's a sort of a problem there because any immigrant nation, and of course America was one also, as, like Australia, as the waves pass through, and you noticed in that picture you've got the workers, the strikers, and you've got a line of men with rifles, and just behind them, You've got the factory owners and their representatives. Mm -hmm. There they are with their nice bowler hats mm -hmm. and their dark coats. And I came to my thought that, well, these men here have achieved their transformation. Mm -hmm. But it's a different... Oh. It's If you want to define what kinds of transformations need to be realised or are realised, they've achieved their transformation. The American dream for them is real. Sure. So that the, the next wave mm -hmm. is really just causing um, an obstruction, sure. undermining their achievements. Mm -hmm. and, and all the time I kept thinking, when my parents came out here in the 1950s, early 50s, mm -hmm. when they first came to, after they became citizens and they came to vote, and we lived in, like a lot of migrants, in the poor suburbs, Collingwood, oh, you don't know them, everyone here would know them, Collingwood, Richmond, Fitzroy. And now in that mix was, it was very, you know, migrants, completely migrants, but also very, very poor Australians. People who never recovered from the First World War, the Depression or the Second World War people who were poor anyway, and in fact, a large part of the population couldn't raise their heads very high for quite some time. Now, my parents couldn't understand. When it came to voting time, mm -hmm. here they were, they came with nothing from a devastated Europe with a suitcase, and they worked in the factories. And they renovated the slums and that's probably, I'm sure that happened in New York yeah. as well. But when it came to voting, they said, it's, you know, the, things are tough. It's tough for everybody here. There's the Labour Party, there's the Catholic Party, which was were called the DLP, and there was the Menzies Liberal Government, the Conservative Government. They couldn't believe mm -hmm. that. Liberal conservatives, with the support of the Catholics, mm -hmm. kept winning government. And they would say, look at these people. They're wearing rags. They can't look after themselves. Their children are in an appalling condition. Why do they vote for the people that are the wealthy people? Of course, of course it was that. But we're talking about how people, what they bring with them. And they brought with them, they brought, I'm sorry, I'll finish. They brought with them the same sorts of thoughts that we're coming here, we're new Australians, if we work hard, we will benefit from it, we, we can do what we want. And I think there is that, there is a similarity in terms of um, the the frustration with the fact that the, the, the people of the left who came from Greece would have really couldn't understand that there was a class thing that was going on as well. And they used to say, why does the poor working class mm -hmm. vote 
for the the well, that's the great uh, question of the 21st century as well, no? uh, <laughs> the million dollar question. Uh, just a very brief note. This photo illustrates the different, and you're right, the different perceptions of Americanism. And we have to think of Australianism, Greekness, all these ideologies as open spaces of confrontation between different understandings of the world. Of course, that side of the photo understands Americanism in a way of, you know, capitalist development, personal success, anti-union, the idea that socialism is a foreign disease coming to the states with the immigrants. Don't forget that during the McCarthy period, the committee is the House Committee for Un-American Activists, which means that the idea of social antagonism is alien to the national understanding of the United States. Who were the people in the, eight, in the Haymarket event, the protagonists? German anarchists. So what does that imply? That these people bring with them dangerous ideas. On the other side, you see a different understanding of Americanism, where it's working class Americanism, illustrating different values. And what I'm interested in is the moments in history where one could see a balance between these two narratives to the, that takes us to the issue of political imagination. Whereas now, I think our political imagination is much more dystopic. And this is also seen, for instance, in uh, science fiction. We, we have lost the tradition of people of the 19th century writing about the future as a, as a future with no issues, huh? where humanity will solve all uh, social problems. And then you have Black Mirror and you know, TV series and science fiction that always the future is dystopic. And there are the limitations of our political imagination. Anyway, well, that's uh, This is 1914, quite early. Oh, very early. Very early. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. I have lots of questions, but I will read your book. <laughs> I'll limit it to just one. Um, you talked about the third generation, and you spoke about how the ideas changed, and these children or grandchildren were living in a very different world. Mm -hmm. I'd like to push you further forward, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. I, this is from the perspective of I'm a historian of the Vietnam War, the Australian experience mm -hmm. of the Vietnam War, among other things. So, and as we said, the things that were happening in the US that you're speaking about did happen later because we had this huge influx from the 50s. I just want to know how these ideas of thoughts of um, ethnic nationals positioning themselves mm. as looking forward to a post-capitalist society if you know, and if you could find yeah. the sources, were sort of went over into their great-grandchildren that were perhaps protesting against the Vietnam War? More. Yeah, that's a good question, because it, this takes us to a different episode, which is the 1960s and 70s, where again the Vietnam War is related to what's happening in Greece, and this is the Greek dictatorship. So there's a younger generation usually educated, usually in radical politics, in academic radical politics, not working class radical politics, that will address the question of the Vietnam War in relation to what's happening in Greece. A dictatorship, American-backed dictatorship in Greece, the Americans are killing innocent people in Vietnam. The interesting thing, though, in the United States is that up to a large extent, the anti-dictatorship movement does not come from the inner world of the Greek American community. It usually comes from immigrants and students that go to the States in the 1960s. And they bring with them possibly the political experiences from the Greece of the 1950s and the Civil War. So in a way, I would argue that the world of the 1930s and, by the, and 40s had disappeared in the 1950s and it did not reemerge. These are not you know, this is the 1960s and 70s is not the great-grandchildren of those people. You have different uh, dynamic, different group that's much more recent in its political experience, uh, in its arrival in the United States. And this is the great, you know, the tragedy for the Greek Americans as a whole, or that explains up to a point why the Greek American communities are so hostile, I would say, to the idea of preserving this type of history. Because they think that this is 
Yeah. You are not, there is not something to be proud. And I have to admit that I experienced that when I went to the States. Uh, you know, we had this documentary, it was uh, in Sydney, I think, and it was screened a couple of years ago. In the States, the communities had no interest in that because they thought that this is an insult. They were not good Americans, all right? Yeah. So, 96 to 97 is a different story. Uh, just one tiny parenthesis there. Most ethnic groups in the 50s developed this very strong anti-communist understanding of the world. Think about Poles. Think about Czechs. Think about immigrants from Eastern Europe. Hungarians. Hungarians. They tend to associate with the most you know, vocal anti-communist uh, politics. They vote for the, it doesn't really matter, they vote for the Democratic Party, but this does not really make a difference. And usually the dissenting voices do not come from the, from the ethnic communities in the 1970s. It's new movements, Latin American students, Latin American workers, the African American movement that is challenging the dominant politics in the United States. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Thank you. Karl Marx said in his Communist Manifesto, mm -hmm. power comes from the barrel of a gun. Now. Or Mao Zedong, but anyway. Mao Zedong, was it? Yeah. yeah. No, it was Karl uh, Marx. But he was following Karl Marx, though. Yeah. 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 But now, are there countries that uh, follow capitalism, are they concerned that there's going to be revolution and it's going to be all these things? But then, when we go into the communist countries, um, like, I don't see people living any better mm -hmm. or anything else. So mm -hmm. what are we achieving? Um, but, and, like, and, and, and people, you know, at different stages of history are repressed. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, even if you look at Indonesia in the Spice Islands, um, where they were producing the nutmeg, cloves, uh, peppers and all that, they weren't getting any benefits. Uh, the benefit was going to the traders and all these other capitalist companies, so to speak. But now, with uh, here, the, the Greeks there, um, was the point missed? Like, they formed the, these organisations probably as discussion groups uh, to advance the idea that um, why, uh, for example, why can't we be fairly paid, uh, for argument's sake? Um, and, OK, America's got his own ideas. We've got Mr Trump today and all this. But um, were they successful to advance their idea that, um, for example, social equality and why can't we fairly paid or enjoy the services that uh, we need as people? Um, and, and so forth. Uh, that's what I'd like to know. Thank you. Well, if you think about it, this is the history of failure. Eh? One with a very narrow understanding or reading of this, this is a history of failure. They tried and they failed. And this is the history, if one thinks about it in very cynical terms, the history of humanity is a history of a continuous failure of trying and efforts to emancipate, and at the end of the day, there's failure. And in the Greek-American world, and in the American world, there's a fascination with the word success. Give me a success story. Give me an immigrant who came here, uh, you know, in rags, and now he's the rich owner of a restaurant uh, business. Scorers, for instance, who is in the film uh, industry. But in any case, within this failure, I think we should consider how these ideas advanced concepts of social equality in very unpredictable ways. The United States in the 20th century witnessed a great revolution that has to do with the emancipation of the black African-American population. Are these struggles connected to that? One can argue that there is a connection, that this continuous effort to connect the American experience to, their, to the quest for social equality was transcended in the 1950s and 60s in the rise of the civil rights movement. 
So I would say that the only way to study history is to go beyond to this binary success and failure. And to understand that history, as it happens in our everyday lives, is not, you know, uh, a thing that either you are success or failure. Where at the same time, failures. Sometimes you will have to study the undercurrents under the current. And and yeah, there you see the methodology is there. Yeah. Yeah. And revolution is not a dinner party, Costine. Hmm? Yeah. And revolution is not a dinner, a dinner party either, you know? It's no, a, but there's this guy over here saying bread or revolution, and even though he aimed for bread, for revolution, he might have just achieved bread. And bread can be a very revolutionary thing. You know, E.P. Thompson, the, the famous English historian, said the revolution is that minute where people on a ship get fed up with eating crumbles of bread and they ask for a loaf. That's what a revolution looks like. I think we might uh, bring things to a close, but Costi will stay back. <laughs> to... So, if I may, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, just ask one more question. Yeah. I won't keep you. Um, the other question I have is that I noticed that uh, Greek in America, from what I'm inferring, is uh, becoming less and less spoken or prominent. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I have is, what can we do with communities of um, Greeks living abroad in mm -hmm. like other places of the world other than Greece uh, do to sustain uh, a part of the language and, and culture and, and um, have, have contact, uh, some contact with, contact with yeah. Greece and with the wider uh, diaspora community uh, because to me, it seems um, a shame to lose the language and culture while we're trying to integrate, assimilate with um, the dominant cultures and, you know, to move up in the world, so to speak. Well, I'm not an expert, but I think you have experts in the room. Uh, the, the program <laughs> here, I have to admit, seems to me a very good way of, you know, making Greek culture relevant. We cannot reproduce Greek culture or language for its own sake. We have to think how it can be relevant to the realities of the 21st century. In the last 10 years, people were interested in what was happening in Greece because of the crisis, and it was a good opportunity to develop programs and projects that will help keep this interest alive. I think the film festival, for, for once, is a magnificent idea. But Honestly, I'm not the expert when it comes to this. Okay. Um, and to get an expanded view on all this commentary, we have, of course, this book, um, Kokini Merigi, at the back, available for sale as well. Uh, big hand of applause for our speaker tonight. An excellent Thank presentation, you. Thank you. Thank you. And he's back on Wednesday to speak about Stavro Kalergi. So hope to see you tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>